Welcome to Tama Talks, brought to you by the Torrance Art Museum Advocates. I'm Janine Madden, current president, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Today's Tama Talk will feature work currently on view at the Torrance Art Museum. Baker's Dozen is on view in the main gallery. It's a survey show of 13 artists whose work made an impression on the curators in this last year. These 13 reflect current directions in Southern Californian contemporary art practices. The show closes on Saturday, June 17th, so be sure to, be sure to stop by if you're in the area. TAM hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the museum is located at 3320 Civic Center Drive in Torrance. Because it is a municipal museum, a program of the City of Torrance Cultural Arts Services Division and the Community Services Department, admission to the museum is free, but donations are accepted and very much appreciated. You can find the TAM on the web at www.torrenceartmuseum.com. This discussion will be recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel with all of our previous TAMA talks. You can access it from our website www.tamadvocates.com. Today's special guest is artist Suzanne Bybee. Suzanne is a visual artist who relocated to Salt Lake City, Utah after residing in Washington, D.C. for many years. She received her Master of Fine Arts painting, painting from Claremont Graduate University in Claremont, California in 2000. She has shown primarily in Los Angeles and Seattle. More recently, she's participated in group exhibitions in Salt Lake City and in Bountiful, Utah. Currently, she is participating in collaborations and curatorial projects with other artists, writing and reviewing artists' work, and creating art in the analog and digital realms. Vacillating between different settings and surfaces, her work searches for new information through a visual dialogue between telematics and the physical, tangible realms of art making. So welcome, Suzanne. We're super, super excited to look at the work uh, that you have up in TAM. It's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm glad it's, you enjoy it. It's my kind of work. So I really loved uh, what you sent to us. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. So um, the language that you sent to me was this is an install shot shot of more mm -hmm. desires for complication. Yes. Um, that is 80 by 80. Uh, Correct. A huge piece. <laughs> um, it's well, there's actually um, an original piece that's bigger than that that's 96 by 96 which is comprised of um four 48 by 48 pieces but these these are individual pieces that go together so this is the second iteration of that idea of creating works that um are connected but are distinct and that they can be interchanged and moved around. I was just going to and ask, can they, being individual, can they actually be moved around uh, to, in different mm -hmm. configurations? Yeah, that was, I mean, that's, and also they're supposed to be together. They were conceived of being up against one another. And so that was the task that I um, put forward to the curators there is just, you you're seeing the images you decide how you want them to be and to wow. where they match up and so you can see the install shot on the left right is um actually different. different than the one on the right because they the way i work is i'm moving around all the time and they're always being switched out and so i thought it should be conveyed um for the install as the same kind of notion that they are interchangeable, but they're they're connected and they can be moved around as needs be. So, and I mean, primarily they could be horizontal across, they could be vertical. I mean, it just depends on the nature of how that person is um, wanting to encounter them. 
Right, right. And I'm noticing that I'm noticing that, you know, um, that uh, the one with the for, for lack of a better um, way to describe it. Let me see. It says, let me make sure I can title it correctly. So is mm. it the for more, uh, more desires for complication upper left clockwise. So part four, rotisserie bone. This and one? that's yes, correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then um, stuck on his foot. Yes. This mm -hmm. one here. So Correct. this piece here stuck on his foot. I was actually going to refer to it as this little piece reminds me of Massachusetts where I live, but I <laughs> oh, noticed funny. in this piece, it's been actually flipped. Yes. Uh, yes. So this is the actual install at the museum. Correct. Okay. Correct. So stuck yep. on his foot. Um, Respire biome is this one. Correct. Eagle's mm -hmm. nest, and then the god yes. helmet. Yes. Yep. That's it. Fascinating. And so, so again, they're interchangeable. They're created individually. There is, I mean, they get worked on at the same time, but there is, there is a, um, there is an order to them, and that's why they're named as such. As far as part one, part two, part three, and part four. I see. And, um, but again, they're. I think of them when I'm working on them as a larger piece that uh, is interconnected. And I so um, some of the things line up, some of them don't, but they can they can be uh, viewed and put together as needs be. And I think that I'm just not interested in the stringency of, of viewing these items. And so I thought it would be... Um, I mean, it's nothing, it's not a new concept, of course, but it's, I just thought it would be a more interesting way to interact with the curator and curators, excuse me, and the registrar and the installer to be able to say, listen, now it's your turn to respond. So you, you put it up the way you think it looks best. And I'm, I'm very pleased with it. And just to be able to see it in a larger space too. Absolutely. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, it does require a great deal of trust um, on behalf of the artist to allow uh, of a curator to basically manipulate the work uh, into the positions that they, they want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. So that it held with the show. And, and uh, we were talking, I was talking earlier with one of the other artists in the show, um, Deborah mm -hmm. Lynn, and she yes. was yeah, we were saying about how, um, you know, the curators, Max in particular, has an excellent eye for joining pieces together with the oh, pieces yes. that are around them. Yes, agreed. I mean, I think it's really important in any kind of uh, space, exhibition or otherwise, to have that level and that capacity of creating a dialogue and a storyline that isn't necessarily linear but is all inclusive and and really is um all these different things all these different things are are, are being informed all at once and so uh yeah uh, both rooms really are very strong for uh for the eye to just be able to encounter everything all at once yeah and that's agreed. the ideal right that's the ideal mm -hmm for any show and um the fact that you're bringing 13 different artists together mm -hmm. uh, to produce that one cohesive show I think is is extraordinary so oh yeah yeah okay now this piece um I'll see her with the anvil um mm -hmm. with untitled now which is the untitled the or untitled um, untitled humor piece is the yes. what's up on the monitor okay. and that's an actual an animated piece that goes with it and I didn't I mean it's such a huge um, it's a large mp4 file and so okay. I didn't send that to you but that video it's it's running on a loop in the in the gallery and that's um, that's one piece using sketchbook animation and then the um, digital piece that's the wallpaper piece that's literally stuck on the wall is using the same platform, the same application, but it's a digital output. It's it's on a product called Phototex, which is a, a temporary wallpaper. 
And I was just um, going to ask, is it something that you had to apply or was it site specific yeah. that you installed it direct? Well, I mean, I guess ultimately well, it's on site specific, they, but yeah, they did it. I mean, it's comes in on a big, uh, backing and you okay. literally peel it off and you stick it on the wall and it doesn't harm any paint and you know it can be applied outside on um, a direct substrate you know glass or a clean surface and um, yeah it's it's really wonderful to work with it I'm I'm actually surprised more artists aren't working with it a lot of photographers use it um, but not a lot of artists for just trying out different things and it's cut to shape too which is a little tricky it's got a lot of really delicate edges to it and when it's produced um, is it cut to shape or is that something that's done afterward it's done afterward they have okay. to print it first and then they have to actually oh they can program the machine the printer to go in and do that cut out cut to shape wow that is extraordinary and so the image uh is digital Digitally created. Yeah. Yes. And so I have a whole line of work that I started probably around 2015 that's that's investigating digital media and what it actually is and what it can be and whether or not it's connected to the analog. Because I felt like a lot of my paintings at the time were anticipating a lot of this imagery, this digital imagery. And so I started... Um, looking at the digital world as a way to um, investigate and ask other questions that I could then go back to the painting, the analog painting, the physical work, to just, again, go back to a dialogue that questions what the physical is, what the digital is, if they're uniquely tied together, are they truly disparate? I, I find that they are very uniquely tied and that they aren't separated. And um, because we're still, even if one is a programmable aspect, it's we're still the person, your yeah, right, yeah, intellectual your, property, as it were. Right. Well, it's not even that. It's still your finger. It's still your mind. Yes. Um, the, I, the IP part of it is, you know, that's a whole nother world and realm, but you have to be aware of. But it's just another place where I like to play and see what I can come up with. And um, because it's digital and because it's in the ether, I just had to start thinking about other ways to take it out of that realm if I wanted to be able to show it other than on a video monitor or you know, an immersive experience to have some kind of output. And there's, there's several different kinds. I can do the wallpaper. I really like printing to aluminum panels. It really, this work really shines on those. But again, it's it's about stepping in in and out of these different realms to to see what's happening to to investigate line and image making in general. And so the humor, untitled humor, is on a loop. Yeah, it's playing on a loop. at the same time. Yeah, and it's actually um, in the same um, sketchbook app. You have the ability to actually make a video of the line work that you're creating. So oh, okay. it's capturing all that line work. And it's not this actual all seer with anvil. It's a different piece, oh. but I wanted to be able to show um, how how I'm working with the line, how, how it's getting layered up, what's getting you know added to, changed out, accelerated, different texture. And so again, the animation aspect in a very simple program is being utilized as a place to investigate many different things, image image things and I, concepts. I find that that um, aspect of showing the process, even if it's not of the actual work that's being displayed is fascinating mm -hmm. to people who visit because I, I think we're always saying, we wish we could uh, it's why Studio System is such a wonderful show because we mm -hmm. are allowing people to come in to the museum and watch people work. Uh, mm -hmm. so they, you know, they and they can come anytime the museum is open and the artist is there to to watch that evolution of blank uh, screen in your case and going mm -hmm. to the ultimate finished product. So ideal. That's that's really extraordinary. I'm 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 so glad that you included the video. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I just thought it might be 
just an interesting, um, just another add on to the dialogue and the sentence. And, and actually it's meant to be funny too. You know, originally I would have liked, and it's just something, it didn't matter to me in the end, but to have that video almost, uh, or the monitor staring down at the, you know, angle down to look at the wallpaper piece is like a, not a mockery, but like, oh, that's, that's, this is this other that's aspect. what it's gonna look like right <laughs> yeah right. and I also and I think didn't... kids that come you know students that come in um mm -hmm. can be very inspired because it's one thing to come in and look at a piece that's hanging and you don't particularly right. it has a digital component but to mm -hmm. actually see the process and 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 be inspired by that to say hey that might be something mm -hmm. I can try not uh, obviously not creating the same caliber of work but at least mm. a foray into that digital atmosphere of mar mar well, it, mark making. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, um, ironically, it's it's still about movement, even though it is a, a, a place in the ether where you're developing these things. And it's something that someone has created, you know, it's a program, but it's a whole nother level of interaction and it's very, it's very basic, but it's also very interesting. So I'm more, I, I like that idea of being able to come back to something and really investigate it instead of getting wrapped up with like the most amazing, you know, meow wolf <laughs> over immersive <laughs> experience. I, right. I don't necessarily need that. I don't have the budget for that, but there are plenty of other means for me to be able to involve myself in that kind of exchange and investigation. And, and I'm, I'm really interested in interacting with a viewer. And so if there's another way to do that, rather than just having something static on the wall, so be it, let Absolutely. it be, you know, a small insight animation where there can still be kind of a moment to look at something. And um, from a, but yeah. From, from a process perspective, um, how, you know, how many iterations of this digital piece did you have to go through to get the final product that you were pleased with it being quote unquote done? You know, how did you know? Um, well, I usually set a, um, a limit for myself. This is about 16 layers and I don't really, um, I'm more interested as, as with the paintings as well. I rarely take anything away I just I build build ah. build 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 okay and so again I'm I'm trying to pay attention to what it is that's emerging um, if it's recognizable or not in this case it's not too recognizable but there are things that you start to see as patterns and I just um, I just keep playing with it and you know that could be several days worth it could be an hour's worth it just really depends on the moment and the intent and things sometimes pop up and that's actually uh, you know things meaning subjects or images that seem somewhat recognizable and that's that's just part of the process that I've developed over time wonderful let's continue oh my these are just okay these so are the these are the bigger pieces that are each 48 by 48 um and one piece is sitting alone by itself on a table and these other three are together on a large scale wall in a, a studio foundry area and these are just called plain um desires for complication but i'm following this trajectory because um there's always this kind of uh, at least in painting, in my mind, uh, this kind of obsession with simplicity. And I'm not interested in that anymore. I'm interested in why things can be as complicated as they are or um, how I make them. Okay. And so that's where all of this, you know, overabundance of line work comes from. And I'm just really interested in that vast quality of what, what happens when you build in a confined space. I mean, do you, and when I say confined space, I'm talking about a square. Um, and what happens when you do that? Does it give some kind of dimensional aspect? Is it sculptural? 
and I would say yes, and it's you know it's still illusionary, but it's it's something that I'm very very interested in that anything that could be depicted on a flat surface could actually have something feel as though it goes beyond that you can actually kind of dive into that right that surface or that that moment that three dimensionality even though it's flat mm -hmm. yeah wow and these are acrylic yes they're all and acrylic other materials too but not digital correct correct but you see that they're very um distinctly tied together as far as this digital realm and this analog realm Absolutely. And that's been exciting. You know, that's been really exciting for me to be able to see that because it's not necessarily um, something that I'm overtly aware of and that I'm obsessed with making the same exact line because they're very different realms. But they're obviously in my mind, in, in my capacity as a processing artist, they're really connecting. They're starting to really cross over. And that's, you know, that's been really exciting for me to have that to, to be able to see that over a specific um time frame you, you had put in your notes about image making it well about the one scenario being uh production in a digital environment um mm -hmm. flat sort of without dimension and mm -hmm. then um the other you had said creating through physical actions using traditional materials and methods on a substrate which is tangible mm -hmm. more tangible and concrete Mm -hmm. And so juxtaposing the two of those, do, do you mean in these pieces or from the digital world to the real world or the, the, di the I, digital the world, digital the world, the world, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the world of the ether, because it isn't a tangible space and this tangible space, which is more concrete where you, at least if you're, um, you know, learning how to paint or to draw that you use a tool that's very specific that you can handle. And yeah, there's a distinction yeah. between those two. And also I'd like to say, which isn't always something that gets talked about is that these analog pieces are really drawings. They're not paintings. I call them paintings, but they're really drawing as painting. And I got rid of paint brushes a while ago in order to be able to draw and so these are really drawings as paintings. Wow. Okay. So, so, and, and, you know, they do have that sort of playful aspect to them. That's, mm -hmm. They're very free. There's not a lot of constricting, you know, you go off the canvas in some places that mix of color, but when, mm -hmm. so when you, so um, you were saying you use marker, grease pencil and, Correct. um, which is interesting because the mark of your hand then is very similar to when you're using a stylus or whatever tool you're using when you use the dig. Oh, when you're using the digital, use your finger also. Wow. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. amazing. Absolutely amazing. That even gives it more tangible, tangibility, if that's a word, yeah. between, yeah. The, between the digital and the analog. Wow. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm the common denominator. Yeah. <laughs> if <Yes>. you will. <laughs> Absolutely. My mind my mind and my physical being are are the common denominator between these two realms and they're for me it's they're getting way more similar. There's a lot more crossover now and a lot of again not mimicry but tangible lines that are um reflective of each other and so they're getting way more reciprocal which is again um very exciting. Very, very. So this is a little bit different. These are um, now they're called the Collagraph Printmaking. Yes, this is um, a program that I just finished up a couple weeks ago through the Creative Aging Project that's here um, in the uh, the Utah Museum uh, Arts Arts and Museums Division and through Saltgrass Printmakers. And I used to do printmaking a very, very, very long time ago. And when the opportunity came up, I signed up for it. And part of the Collagraph workshop is you build up your own plate. You, believe, you um, build up the relief print. And so we were given very simple materials to play around with at the beginning. And some people got more complicated as time went on as far as actual 
carving out of, of surface. But when I was told that we could use something as simple as glue that gets manipulated on the surface of the cardboard plate, you know, a very rigid cardboard, or even masking tape that you can carve into with an X-Acto knife, I thought, oh, I'm going to try this very simple method and see what I can get. And I was really excited and very pleased because for, for a large-scale print, it actually, again, is is connected to this other work, but it's a, it's very different. It has a different nuance. It really, um, for me, being able to see the relief print as a process, as far as how it began with the masking tape and the glue, which of course dries, and then you treat it with shellac. And then once you run it through the press and actually print it, you're getting this whole other unbelievable surface. And so this is just a whole nother opportunity for more investigation of, of surface pushing and surface ideas and image making. Simple, but still that kind of um, kernel, that, that thread of complexity and immensity. So yeah, whole nother thing. <laughs> whole nother thing. And Colograph, um, mm -hmm. is that just the, the name given to the idea of uh, this particular kind of printmaking? Yes, correct. For this particular kind of sur surface, the way you build up the plate. So again, you you build up the plate in a simple way. You can stick things to it, and then you're treating it as kind of a, I mean, you can do a series of prints on it, but really it's, it's an artist proof. I see. And um, you can do, um, you can do etching work with it as far as the printing, or you can do you know, just specific relief prints. And I chose to do relief prints just because the line worked out so well. Absolutely, absolutely, okay. Excuse me, these were so intriguing as well. Um, vintage paper coasters using vintage yes. style appliques. Correct. Um, and then the tea towels with the applique of the vintage mm -hmm. material and then the embroidery. Yes, um, this is a whole nother business venture that I'm involved with here in Salt Lake City with a friend uh, who's another artist and an extraordinary seamstress. Her name is Lisa de France, and our business is Fern and Reed. And these are a whole nother offshoot, and it's all centered around collaborative art and design. And so we utilize different objects that we either have come across at, you know, antique places or vintage stores, estate sales, blah, blah, blah. And we give them a different consideration. And Lisa has an unbelievable amount of vintage textiles and we paw through it and I'm we, we work with different shapes and I do the cutout and she does all of the sewing. And these are just some examples. And I thought it would be interesting to include in this interview just because I'm really, really interested in not just doing one thing. I'm very interested in in having all of these different elements inform all of these other things. So it's not just a a one shot deal. And so I wanted I wanted your viewers to be able to see that um, this is a whole nother process. And so I'm the shapes are still kind of you uniquely mine, but there's a whole nother element now with another person and real collaboration, real design. So it's, we, we just really have a great time. It's a whole nother level of conversation through you know these particular works and just how we come upon different projects. And, and not only just um, the collaboration with L Lisa, you said? Yes. With Lisa, but also with obviously the people who create, you know, the design of the fabric themselves. And so you oh, have yes. the color and the line and the design work and choosing. Agreed. Yeah. How to, and it's not yours. <laughs> you yeah. Know, oh, it, you're so it's used really to a, it. Uh -huh, it's a lot of fun. It's really, it's really um, a great place to test out new ideas and talk about them and See if they even work. Some of them don't work, and and really, just have it be an investigative space. And this is a whole nother studio that we have together. Um, and yeah, it's been a treat. We do a lot of commission work, 
and um, we try different things on if it suits us. And our whole thing is, is that this business, the money that we get from it, if we do, um, it goes right back into the business. So we utilize that money to either buy new things or um, educate ourselves and go to workshops. We're planning a trip coming up in July to go to Boulder, Colorado and into Denver to actually get some new experiences and yeah. So Great. all of it is, it comes right back in. It's, it's really wonderful. Instead of, you know, feeling like we have to meet a quota and make a million dollars in one sure, year or sure. something. Well, I think that freedom like that. too, that freedom too, without all that stress is, um, can kind of is evident in the work as well, right? Where where you're able to just be very, it, it is in your other work as well too, just this idea that there's no construct. You're able to just do what it is that you want to do. And obviously it brings you uh, brings you joy as, as it does to the onlookers like myself, so. <laughs> well, I think too that, you know, playfulness is also an intellectual per pursuit. It's, it's a place to, um, really, I don't want to say get crazy, but you you can do things that maybe you wouldn't normally do in your everyday waking life. And it's wonderful to have a proving, a proving ground for that, a test space. Right. And, you know, to bring in everything all at once, to bring in memory, to bring in time elements, other places, and so on. And that's, you know, that exuberance is, is very um, exciting and confidence building and all these other wonderful things that we don't always get to um, touch base with. Right, right. And, and you know, you were talking earlier too about the, um, I, the part I find so intriguing is that the, that you're move, you know, that you're calling them drawings. But for me, the, the attractive piece, the part I'm attracted most to is the color. And the mm. fact that there are, you know, there's really no palette. It's every color. And mm. I like that. I mean, there's just um, there's something about that that's I I appreciate, uh, and and also just that idea that they are very abstract and uh, very very playful, and they just they're one of those pe pieces. When I'm touring, um, I do a lot of work with people who are experiencing memory loss mm. and mm -hmm. uh, and kids. Uh, mm -hmm. so kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, but mm -hmm. uh, I always ask the same question when you're looking at this piece, how do you, how does it make you feel? And mm. uh, the earlier works that we were looking at, um, go back, mm -hmm. you know, that's a very, I don't know, for me, it evokes a very happy feeling. There's an energy to it that, um, that I sense when I am you know if I were to be standing in front of it and I'm only looking at it on the screen so well good yeah yeah <laughs> I mean and I can't I I can't honestly say that any one of them or any one piece is you know rooted in only one kind of feeling because they're really about um, several different things happening all at once but there is humor and kind of accepting that notion that you're not just looking at one um, particularly playful thing or happy thing because some of them are are dark some of them have dark titles and that's you know that's also a part of that instant when I'm naming them or getting to know them and so um, that influence is still there but I'd say for the most part they're for me they're very funny and and kind of silly and ridiculous but I find that, you know, intellectually very stimulating. Well, good. Yeah. And that, and that at the end of the day, I mean, that, that um, create as an artist creating art that self-satisfies, I think is, is uh, first and foremost, I think the people who are creating work to generate a, a viewer's response, um, it's sort of like when you're singing a song and you're not really feeling it. Um, you know, you're just <laughs> yeah. sort of coming along and you don't really, it's not like you're singing it. And so, um, yeah, this, well, this, work is, this work isn't it for, it, it's not for everybody. I realize that too. And that's, that's okay. Um, because a lot of people do think of it as very frivolous and goofy and what's the point of it. And it's like, well, it's just investigative and you know, this is, this is where it's at right now yeah. at this point in time. 
Right. And right. there's and plenty of time for it to get dark and goth or whatever you want it to be in sure, the end. Sure. I, and but, you know, I, I also think if you were to have stripped the color and just mm. this particular piece, let's say in, in just a black and white, it, w- it would have a di- very different, you'd have a very different response to it. And so for, for me, looking well, at this piece, it's very sort of like sci-fi graffiti. I- I'm not really sure how to even, yeah, I sure. love it. Yeah, it's a great piece. Oh, thank you. I love mean, it. I, you know, truth be told, I do go through periods where I take away all the color and I only use the primary colors, black and white, as a way to kind of clean clean my head out and clean the palette just to see where it can go and and get back to seeing things, you know, in a, in a purely kind of nuanced way. And that's really helpful. And I think that much of this color work is, is still connected to that kind of process of just trying it all out and trusting what you're doing instead of feeling as though it can only be one specific palette. And, right. and there's value in limitation, but there's also um, a wonderful way to be able to blow that wide open and see absolutely. where it goes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I get, excuse me again, I am just um, really blown away by the pieces that you have in the show. Best of luck with your Fern and Reed uh, Thank you. collaboration which is always kind of interesting because that's, you know, you're like you said, you're not only collaborating with your materials, but you're also collaborating with another very artistic person. Yes, and so yes. Uh, it's nice when those kinds of collaborations work well and you mesh kind of create. Yes. Yeah, I, I try to um, seek out as many people as possible without getting completely overwhelmed by an avalanche of projects. But I, you know, I have some other people that I work with um, on the East Coast with a project that they're involved in through the AIR gallery um, in Brooklyn, uh, which is a women's run gallery. And their whole thing is about being the museum where you yourself, as the artist, you make the museum what you need it to be. And so there are two artists in upstate New York who've developed that notion or this, this project and they both each have satellites called Museum for Contemporary Artists. And their studios are their museums and people are invited to come. And I just, you know, this kind of energy is very important for us to tap into and to be able to be open to the exchange and the collaborative nature of, of what people are doing everywhere. So um, yeah, it's an exciting time. Absolutely. absolutely, And, you know, you don't have to um, sacrifice your own creativity to make it work with someone else's. I think being able to mesh uh, nicely oh, yeah. with someone else's ideal. It's very freeing to work collaboratively with people. There's plenty of artists who are, you know, very isolated and don't um, reveal any secrets to anybody and keep, you know, keep a, keep a tight rein on what they're doing. And I find that I have way more ideas when I'm doing this kind of high level interaction. It's, it's fantastic. You know, other problems get solved outside of my own studio and I can take that same energy and bring it back. So not to get off on a tangent. No, but it's it's <laughs> quite, quite a catalyst. So that's, that's the ideal. That's the ideal. Well, I thank you. I have one little final last slide here. I thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, thank like you. I- We'll put this on the website and um, we hope that folks will be able to get out to the museum and see your pieces in real life. Um, uh, yes. I think that uh, when you were talking about that idea of even though it's just a, a even though it's a flat surface, that three dimensionality of the line work and the uh, the composition, I think, is is sounds so intriguing. So um I would like to thank everybody for watching and and uh, stay tuned for our next uh, Tama Talk coming up uh, within the next couple of days. So thanks so very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity.